but so I always give it like a few minutes and put questions in the chat. Hey chat, is the sound working? Question mark, sound working, question mark. Uh, and then I think it takes like 15 seconds for it to, for me to post a message and then to get to them and then for them to send one back. I think, I think that's the delay. I think I've timed it. And that's, that's best case scenario if they're paying attention. Yeah. Right. Usually, usually they are. They like, they troll me. The trolls oh, are okay. always, always in the audience. <laughs> like, nope, sound is not working. I hate you. Clearly, clearly they're telling the truth because that's clearly what he asks. All right. Everything looks good. Clay, how's it going? Justin, Frank. All right. We're good. So, William, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Yeah, my name is William James Harris, and I have been in uh, an apologetics ministry for quite a few years now. I've written a couple of books on apologetics and how to view the universe uh, through the lens of reason, logic, and empirical data. And uh, I believe that uh, those all kind of point towards... Um, this fact that there must be something out there greater than us. And so I've been working with a, a college campus ministry. We call it the Deep Questions Club. And so everybody's got deep questions. Everybody has kind of like these, you know, things that they've been wondering about. And so what we do is we provide a safe space to just hang out and talk about uh, the deep questions of like, you know, does truth exist? Like, how did we get here? What's the meaning of life? You know, it's like, what's up with ethics and morality and, you know, all that kind of thing. And then, you know, what happens when we die? So these are all big questions and everybody's welcome to our group. Um, we were meeting at UCLA and Santa Monica College until the March 13th shutdown. And then I moved to Salt Lake City and I was working with some people at the University of Utah here. And then we got a shutdown here. So right now we're not meeting in person anywhere. So that's why we're doing uh, some Zoom meetings and chatting online and trying to keep things going. It's a tough time for everybody who interacts with people face to face. I mean, I don't know what industry is thriving right now that does that. I know. Uh, <laughs> YouTube pretty much. YouTube. YouTube. Me. There you go. There you go. So, so where can we uh, connect with this group to, because it's open to everybody, so. Yeah, it's open to everybody. Um, we're, we're currently not doing Zoom meetings anymore because we've realized that uh, when you have a group of people, Zoom just kind of doesn't really have that connection that we have when you're on campus. Uh, but my website is Ready, Set, Question. I love to question everything. So readysetquestion.com. And the name of our group is the Deep Questions Club. Awesome. So uh, you mentioned that you said empirical evidence, reason, and logic seem to point to a God. And I, as you can imagine, is, am an atheist. So I think the opposite. I think that naturalism better explains everything about the world. So could you tell me a little bit about what evidences for empirical evidence and reason and logic do you think indicate the existence of a God? Well, you know, the interesting thing about it is that... Um, I don't believe in just any God. I mean, to quote Richard Dawkins, he says that we're all atheists about every of everyone else's gods, right? He just took it one step further and he has become atheist about the last God. And so with that said is I am not atheist about the last God. And what I mean by the last God is we have to define who we're talking about, right? So I'm talking about the God of the Bible, otherwise known as Jehovah, uh, who represented himself across the, the prophets and then also ultimately as Jesus Christ. So I totally affirm the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Judeo-Christian narrative. And so that is the God that I am talking about. I know that we could talk about all the other ones, but uh, I think it's good to define our terms up front because Socrates says that is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah, and I appreciate that. A lot of atheists, I get it. I get it in the comments a lot. Why are you talking about this deistic anthropomorphic being that no one knows about? What is the specific one you want to know about? So I really appreciate you yeah. specifically laying out this is the God you're arguing for. That's a thing many theists don't do. Well, I don't consider myself a theist. I consider myself a follower of Jesus Christ, cool. <laughs> who happens to be the creator of the universe. <laughs> so, so yeah, what what evidence do you think indicates that uh, Jesus is actually? a God and not just a human being that existed a few thousand years ago? Well, that's a really good question. You know, uh, people know that Jesus was a real person, that he actually walked on earth about 2000 years ago. Many historians actually point to his existence. Uh, Christian haters, Jewish haters, uh, Greco-Roman historians of their time. I don't think that there's any serious scholar out there right now that denounces the existence of a person 
uh, who lived 2,000 years ago by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, so just to then, clarify, there are two. There are two, two serious scholars who do that, and that's about it. Yeah. So overwhelmingly, you know, we got, I guess, the other however many thousands of scholars. People point to that. And so I, I would be really interested to hear what these scholars have to say. But for the most part, I would say that the world is in agreement that not only did Jesus of Nazareth exist, but the teachings that have been attributed to him have been um, of the highest quality. People say, oh, he's a great teacher. I just don't believe he's God. Or I believe that you know, he was a really great prophet or you know, he, he, he brought a very good moral code. And so then that's the question that I think we all have to be asking as um, people who are denouncing Christ or, you know, so in support of following him and emulating our lives after him is, is who was he? And so I think that is the dividing question. And so, you know, if he is just a great prophet uh, and a great teacher, then the question you have to ask yourselves is, you know, he said that uh, Moses prophesied about him in the book of Genesis. He also said that he was older than Abraham. You know, before your ancestor Abraham, I am, is what he said. And that's a really interesting way to uh, use that uh, I am or, or to be. He just said, I am, meaning there is no ending. There is no beginning. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He, he was actually speaking that about himself. Uh, another thing is the prophet Isaiah uh, prophesied that his... Um, birth. Uh, Daniel prophesied uh, his arrival. And then Jesus himself affirmed Isaiah's prophecy and also affirmed Daniel's prophecy. And so at that point, what you have to ask yourself is, is Jesus someone you can just say, well, he was a good teacher or, or he was a, a good prophet? No. I mean, according to what he said, he was either God or he was a lunatic. And so that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Was, was Jesus a good teacher? Um, no, if he's a lunatic and he's claiming that he's God and all these prophecies point to him, he's got to be nuts. Well, what do you mean by that? Because I think there are many lunatics who are great teachers. Like if you look at uh, especially Greek, uh, Greek philosophers, many of them are crazy, completely nuts, but they were great. Uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche was totally nuts. Great teacher, great philosopher. Most of the greatest philosophers uh, throughout history have been completely insane. So I don't think those are mutually exclusive. I think you can be a great teacher and not have a good grasp on reality. Um, forget what's the Freud. Freud is another great example. Completely nuts. Great, great advancements in psychology that hadn't been seen before. So I don't think there's a conflict between uh, being a good teacher and promoting good ideas that hadn't been seen before and not having a good grasp on reality. And so I think that I, I grant that Jesus existed for sure. That's, that's the consensus. You're absolutely right. Uh, and I think he, many of his teachings were good in the sense that I don't think any of them were original for the most part. I think they, they're predated, but I think they were good for the most part, but I don't think that means that he had any any claim to actually being a God. And, and the prophecies, like, I don't think any of the prophecies actually clearly make any kind of prophecy about Jesus in particular, uh, most of the historical consensus on those is that they're pretty vague. They could apply to billions of different people. They usually apply to other people in the time period that they were made, usually not specifically to Jesus. They don't really seem to indicate anything for the most part from the historians I've talked to. So I don't think they actually, like if there, if there was a clear prediction that there is a Jesus of Nazareth will be born at this time and this date and he will do exactly these things, then that would be great. But I don't think any of them say that they're all pretty vague. So I don't see how any of that is actually evidence of him being a God, not just a crazy teacher like most of the other philosophers throughout history. All right. Um, I totally hear what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to somebody's mental health. Obviously musicians nowadays are the same way. I mean, uh, the lead singer of uh, Stone Temple Pilots recently OD'd from heroin, but he made great music, right? Okay, you can't throw that out. Uh, so I agree with you there. Um, but the the difference is, you know, I don't I don't believe that um, uh, Scott Weiland was teaching that doing heroin was good when it comes to his music, of course, right? And so when it comes to Jesus's craziness, um, he was teaching that he was God. He told uh, the Pharisees that if they had seen him, then they had seen the Father, and he told them that he was older than Abraham. And so these are these are points in his teachings that verify why he is who he says he is. And it's not like he did a moral teaching and then over here he said he was you know crazy 
crazy running down the street, you know, streaking or wiping poo on the wall or something that he was actually incorporating all of the potential uh, lunatic ideas of this man God inside of his moral teachings. So at that, at that point, um, it's really difficult to say that Jesus was a good teacher if all of those are blended together. And so I, I believe what uh, C.S. Lewis had to say about it is that, you know, it, there's a lot of nonsense in saying that he was a good teacher because he was either a lunatic or he, had, or he was who he says he was. So then the question we have to ask ourselves is, um, you know, was his deity true? Is, is that something that we can look into? And so I believe that the authenticity of the Judeo-Christian narrative from Genesis to Revelation is the best evidence that points towards the deity of Christ. And I can give you a couple of examples why. The first one has to do with, you know, if you flip, this is my Bible, it's, it's all torn apart and I, I preach at high schools when there's no COVID. So I get these visitors passes. So I always stick them on there. But anyway, if you flip through here, any, any verse, any location, name, date, place, mountain, kingdom, ruler, river, stream, body of water that is mentioned, they actually exist in real life. People have found the foundation of David's palace. They've found the place where Goliath is from. We know where the early church was when it came to uh, Jesus's life. And so when you look at other scriptures from other religions, like say the Bhagavad Gita, or let's say I live in Salt Lake City now. So let's look at the Book of Mormon. None of these books can verify their locations. And so when you look at at any any scripture whatsoever, you can go to Google Maps and look it up. Uh, you know, if COVID was over and you're able to travel and you had an extra, you know, a couple thousand bucks, you could go to the Middle East. You could actually look at these sites yourself. Now, that's not definitive proof that these all these stories actually took place, but it's actually just one little egg in that basket of supportive proof. Um, I would say another reason why the scriptures are authentic has to do with the fact that most mythological stories um, build up the heroes in a way that are hero-esque. They're fantastical. But the, the Bible, I don't know if you've ever read it, but the people that they talk about, it is so embarrassing. It's, in, it's embarrassing the way that they portray the Jews, how they're turning their back on God, how they go and they worship all these false idols and, and do all these things that are blatantly against what God has instructed them to do. And they do it time and time again. And then Jesus even told his disciples, uh, Peter, for example, that he was going to deny that he even knew him. And then Peter's like denying Jesus, you know, three times within 24 hours, even in front of like a 12 year old little slave girl, he was just like, no, I didn't know Jesus. And so I just think that the eyewitness testimony and the way that the characters are built in the Bible, there's no way that anybody was trying to, to paint them in a, in a mythical heroic light. I mean, these guys were, were messing up all the time, all the time. Sure. So, uh, I have read the Bible. I've read it cover to cover twice. Um, but I don't see how the embarrassment factor lends credence to the truth. Like, I don't think the combination of words you use has any more relevance to them being true or not. But I don't see how that actually makes it more likely to be true, the fact that they made embarrassing things while other people made non-embarrassing things. I don't think that makes the story uh, more likely to be true. Like, for example, in, in mentioning, they, they do mention many historical places that did exist, for sure. Like, so does Harry Potter. Harry Potter mentions the King's Cross Station, but that doesn't lend credence to any of the other things. And there's many places, because you said the whole Bible. I'm, I'm a little perplexed by that, because the scholarly consensus, just like it is that Jesus existed, is that Moses didn't exist, and neither did Abraham or Isaac or Cain or Abel, that pretty much all of the patriarchs and matriarchs of the Old Testament are fictional. That That's the consensus about, at the same degree, as the consensus that Jesus existed. So most of those things didn't occur. We know for certain that there was no global flood. There's not enough water to actually accomplish that anyway. So it seems like there's there's many things in the Bible that did not occur, places that did not exist, uh, timeline errors where certain cities existed before uh, the people in them, the the genealogies don't seem to light up. 900-year-old people don't couldn't have existed back then. Average age was like 30. So there's lots of factual errors in the Bible that the consensus of historians uh, think didn't happen and didn't exist, just like they think, it's at the same degree they think Jesus did exist. 
Well, that's interesting that you said that about the patriarchs, because um, obviously, I don't know if you're familiar with where Abraham um, ended up buying the land for his grave. He actually went to the Hittites and he asked if he could purchase land. And the Hittites loved Abraham. And they said, hey, we just want to give you this land. We want to give you this cave where you can you know, bury yourself and your family someday. And Abraham was like, no, 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 I, I want to pay for it. So it was in Hebron. It was the uh, field of Machpelah, and right there is actually a cave. And uh, Abraham instructed his servants to bury him in that cave after he died. And then what's interesting is that when he had uh, Isaac, uh, Isaac and his wife were in the bury there, and then Jacob and one of his wives were buried there. And uh, if you if you look at the story of Joseph, he actually asked the Pharaoh if he could take his father's bones back to the field of Machpelah um, that you know Abraham bought from the Hittites. And it's actually called the Cave of the Patriarchs. And you can go there on Google Maps right now. You can actually see the grave site. Uh, it's been there for a very long time. And uh, I, I would say most archaeologists uh, uh, affirm that that is something that actually exists. And so I think that's pretty good evidence. But I think one of the questions that I have to, to ask you, and, and I ask this to a lot of um, atheists, uh, is that so making a claim that there is no God, I think, deserves supporting evidence. And so I'm making a claim that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and that the authenticity of Scripture is true. And so what I'm doing is I'm giving little nuggets of evidence archaeology that, you know, they could be true, they could not be true, but I'm actually offering positive evidence in support of what I believe to be true. And so the thing that I've I've run into with, with many, many atheists is that there's actually, I don't ever get anything other than discounting the Bible as support that there is no God, like the, the God doesn't exist. And so it really comes down to a head and a heart posture. It's like, well, I don't see that evidence to be valuable and I don't really want there to be a, a God. And so therefore I'm going to rip on the Bible to show that atheism is true. But in reality, that's not giving supportive evidence to atheism. So I guess the question that I have to ask is I could give you a thousand different points of why I believe that Jesus is who he says he is and why scripture is authentic. And sure, you can discount those, but you're never going to be supporting in a positive way your stance that there is no God. So I was just wondering, is, I just gave you some lines of evidence. I can give you a hundred more. Could you give me a couple of lines of evidence that shows that God doesn't exist, that, that, that atheism is logical and reasonable with supporting evidence? Sure, I'll definitely do that. But I just want to bring up that other point about the Tomb of the Patriarchs. I mean, there is a location that has that name, but there is absolutely no evidence that any of those patriarchs existed or their bones were ever there. That's the... Because, again, I, I like evidence and I like the consensus. I go with the experts are pretty reliable. They know what they're talking about, just like Jesus existed. I'm like, yep, they, they know it. I'm going to go with them. Uh, but they also know that those guys didn't exist. Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Cain, Abel, Sarah. They, they, those are equally as fabricated as Jesus is equally real. So I think it's really... I guess I'd have to ask you, how did you come to the conclusion that none of them are real? Because I just did a deep study uh, in the book of Exodus, and what's interesting is that um, the brother of Moses, Aaron, was from the tribe of Levi, just like Moses was, and he was actually placed into the royal priesthood. And the royal priesthood actually has to go from father to son, right? And to father to son, to father to son. So forcibly, what we would see is some sort of consistency when it comes to the Y chromosome. And so the Jews have actually sequenced their DNA within the house of Levi. And there's this really awesome anomaly that took place within the priesthood that actually shows that they had a patriarch around the time of when Moses would have existed. And that would have been Aaron. Uh, Moses's brother. And so I, I find that to be pretty great evidence in supporting that this priestly line has been passed down from Y chromosome to Y chromosome. And so I, I would say at that point, it's like, well, if that anomaly exists when it comes to the human genome, specifically within you know the house of Levi, then why would we say that perhaps Aaron didn't exist and you know Moses didn't exist? Uh, I feel like there would have to be some supportive evidence for the fact that he wasn't a real character because I can give you a hundred different points supporting that he he is, but to just whitewash it and say, well, we know that these people weren't real. It's like, well, why? 
Well, yeah. Why so, they so there definitely were patriarchs. Um, okay. There were there were always patriarchs. So that's not an anomaly. That's the standard. So as you said, these were passed down from father to son, and it didn't really matter who the father was. They would always have this same genetic marker that the the Y chromosomes would have the same uh, genealogical similarities. No matter if if their grandfather was King Tut, you'd see the same thing. Uh, it's just because it it any parental relationship is going to have the same genealogical similarities. That doesn't mean that it was Moses or, or Abraham or any of the ones from the Bible. And, and the reason we think none of them existed is because the historical narrative doesn't fit. The timeline doesn't fit. The, the, there's no archaeological evidence for any of these places, like the, the, the Exodus specifically. Zero archaeological evidence has ever been found to support that. So given the kind of story that it is, it, the numbers proposed, the the where they traveled to, nothing being there, shows that it probably didn't occur with the, with a high level of probability. Um, you can go through each of the stories, you get the exact same things, that most of them have no supporting evidence all, at all. That what they do is kind of like what Harry Potter does, is when uh, J.K. Rowling mentions, here is King Cro King's Cross Station, that isn't evidence that there is a one of the pillars that's magical and you can walk through it. It's just evidence that she used a historical location and then built a story around that, which is exactly what the consensus is about the stories of the, the patriarchs and matriarchs in the Old Testament. And then there's significant evidence that none of that actually took place. It's, it's pretty conclusively shown to not be real. That's why there's such a strong consensus, because of the lack of evidence of any claims uh, supporting the stories in the first place. Like in the case of those kinds of claims the lack of evidence is evidence of absence like if i say is there is there is there water in this cup and i show there's no water in it that's good evidence there's no water so if you claim that there's a mass exodus that occurred during any time period across a specific route in the middle east and you check the route and there's no evidence of any sufficient number of people going through there that's good evidence it did not occur so we can conclude at least that one aspect of the Moses story is completely fabricated. And we can go through step by step and show, yeah, all of these seem like they're pretty fabricated. And that's how the experts come to the conclusion, yeah, these didn't occur. But, but you want evidence for why I am an atheist. So my evidence against a God would be that, one, all claims are imaginary until demonstrated otherwise. So if you present no supporting way to differentiate imagination from reality, then whatever you're claiming it to be, it's automatically imaginary. So it's automatically false. Like if I said, a leprechaun knocked over the cup. Well, until I can provide some supporting evidence, it's just in my imagination. Or if I said, a squirrel knocked over the cup. And again, until I can provide some supporting evidence, that's also in my imagination. So any hypothesis starts as imaginary until you provide some supporting evidence. Um, some positive evidence against a God, specifically the Christian God, would be the problem of suffering would be the, the best one I like to go to. If there was an all-good, all-powerful God, then... He could have created a world that was morally better than this one. And the fact that he didn't means he's either not powerful enough to do it or he's not moral. He's just immoral because he created an immoral world. Um, and it's pretty easy to demonstrate this. All he would have had to have done is add one extra law of physics, which is it is physically impossible for any one person to force any other to do anything they don't consent to. That, that's the one law he could have added. So we'd have everything about humans would be the same. You still have free will, you still have sin, you still have desires and line and all those things. But you had one law of physics, which is it's physically impossible for any person to force another to do anything they don't consent to. And you get a universe that is infinitely more moral than this one. Uh, and so the fact that a God did not do that uh, shows that either it's not, all, not powerful enough, not good enough, or apathetic and doesn't really care. And so... I, I believe in objective morality, like most philosophers. And so, since we do know there is an objective moral standard, which I am basing this off of, and since God did not uh, adhere to that, did not try to achieve the highest moral standard that he could have, then he may, must not be moral. He must be an immoral God, or doesn't exist, or is not powerful. Well, I'm glad that you believe in objective morality. That's great. I think we would have to agree that um, I, uh, you and I, we both agree on uh, objective morality. I would say that we'd have to agree on the on the fact that I have a basis and a source for where objective morality comes from, and you have to claim that there is no source for objective morality. Um, well, I would definitely disagree there. So, so okay. So where where do you find your source for objective morality? So I am uh, moral realism is the majority in philosophy of professional philosophers. Uh, I am what's called a moral naturalist. So I think. Morality is a higher order emergent property in nature. It's 
easy way to think of it is a law of nature like gravity. Uh, it exists kind of like fitness. Fitness is a property of um, animals that if they can survive in more environments, they're more fit. Now, so morality is kind of like that. It's analogous to that where there's this higher order property that's objective in the world that describes how agents can interact in an environment. And that's, that's what morality is. It's a law of nature. And so then non-humans have morality then? Yes. I would apply it to all conscious agents. Oh, wow. That's an interesting way to look at it. I mean, I guess you'd have to come up with some uh, evidence and I could do, you know, what you do about uh, the evidence that I present when it comes to affirming the scripture. Uh, but for, for the way that I've seen it, uh, I don't see morality as being a law of nature. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of reasons why I, I don't see that morality is a law of nature. Uh, the first is that it, it, it requires an intelligence in order for us to understand what morality is. Because uh, the thing about it is when you when you have a law, let's say, for example, a moral law, right? It must be coming from a lawgiver because laws don't get made without a lawmaker. For example, if, if you're driving down the street and you see a speed limit, right? that speed limit didn't just exist. It actually had to come from a municipal law giving body that said we are going to give this law and here it is so when you look at practically everything um and and here's some evidence for you why i, I don't see that uh leprechauns have knocked over any glasses and i i i don't believe that god is is like a a mythical creature that i'm making up because i actually have evidence to point to it but i think one of the the things that is really hard pressed for an atheist to uh to talk about is, you know, life coming from non-life. I think that's a big one. Uh, it, obviously, Louis Pasteur did a lot of studying in that. Uh, he actually proved back in the 1800s that uh, abiogenesis doesn't happen. He actually uh, showed that that non-life only uh, is is non-living, and, and and life comes from life. And I don't know if if you've uh, heard of the law of what is it um he calls it uh oh, spontaneous generation oops. there you go spontaneous generation and uh another thing would be information i think is is a huge one that is really difficult to to talk about when it comes to where does it come from because most information comes from uh, other information comes from a mind and when you look at the universe i, I think uh, Dennis Prager, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He does a lot of commentaries and he runs Prager University. I actually have a quote from him that I want to read because I, I think this is actually just quite phenomenal. Um, so he says in uh, which is called the Rational Bible, it's his commentary on the book of Exodus. He says that one must distinguish between non-rational and anti-rational or the irrational. There is most certainly a place for the non-rational in life much of what is beautiful, love and art, for example, transcending uh, reason. And a great deal of good is achieved by not following the distates of pure reason. For example, it is not fully rational for one to risk their life to save another person, but there is no place for the anti-rational. Are you, are you picking up what he's saying here? It's, it's not rational for somebody to risk their life to save somebody else that they would not benefit from. Uh, that is not fully rational, but it's it's not anti-rational. And what he's saying is, um, you know, some atheists argue belief in a God who created the world and history and revealed his moral will through the Ten Commandments is also contrary to reason. But they equate lack of scientific proof with irrationality. While not scientifically provable, there is nothing anti-rational about believing in a creator. On the contrary, that is anti-rational, it is to believe that the universe came out by itself, that intelligence was not created by intelligence, and that life sprang from non-life. And even though we have no evidence that it did. And so what, what we have to look at is what is the most rational way to look at the universe? So when we see something that is living, we're not going to rationally say that it came from something that was not living. And so when we see the existence of a law, we're not going to assume that it came from chaos or lawlessness. 
And so what you have in the universe is this idea called entropy. And you have order that is moving to chaos. And it's quite irrational when we look at anything that we can observe, test, replicate, and verify that chaos will naturally form order and increase in complexity because of nothing. And so that's kind of where I see atheism as being uh, counter what science actually shows us. Okay, yeah, so definitely a lot of things there to talk about. First is what makes a reasonable hypothesis. In my estimation, what counts makes something rational is if you have two hypotheses, like what knocked over the cup. If I think it could have been a squirrel, could have been the wind, someone could have bumped the table, could have been aliens, whatever. And if you say that my hypothesis is that a squirrel knocked over the cup, and your hypothesis is, is that the wind knocked over the cup, and I, I make a prediction, I say, if a squirrel knocked over the cup, I can look around the cup and see squirrel droppings, and, and then we go and look, and we see, oh, there's squirrel droppings. That's really good evidence for my hypothesis, because mine could predict something about the world we didn't know yet, and it got it right. I mean, would you, would you agree that that's a good basis of evidence if that one hypothesis can predict something about the future. That's, that's good evidence, right? I would extend that as being good evidence if you had returned the favor to me, because sure. that's exactly what I've been doing with the Bible. Like there's squirrel droppings, right? Proverbially all over archeology span everywhere. Atheists will read certain passages and they're not doing what the author of Harry Potter did and putting something in that everybody already knows about. They're actually looking for cities that have not been discovered. For example, they had never found David's temple for many, many years. And then they started reading the scriptures for clues. And so there are about 25,000 different archaeological finds, artifacts that have actually been discovered, not haphazardly and then being like, oh, we found these and then look, they're in the Bible. But it's the opposite. They were found because somebody was reading the Bible and wondering, I wonder if that actually exists. And they go out and they look for it. And so, uh, I mean, if, if you can extend that as good evidence towards me affirming the Bible, I would extend good evidence for seeing squirrel droppings around a knocked over cup. I just think that if we're going to have a, you know, a street here, it's got to be a two way street as opposed to a one way. Oh yeah. I, so, yeah I'm I'll... happy to grant that future okay. testable predictions are evidence for anybody. I mean, I don't think those sure. are future testable predictions. Like if the people at David's time knew about David's temple and they wrote about it in a book, they're not predicting that David's temple like would be built in the future. Like if it was a prophecy, that would be a future testable prediction. But if they're just writing down that there was a temple at this location, they're not predicting anything. They're just describing what they already know. So if right, they, and, they, and we didn't know where it was. Right. So somebody somebody read the Bible and then went and found it. And so what I'm saying is that when I gave evidence about archaeology, you kind of like washed it over and just dismissed it. And so then now you want me to affirm evidence that you're giving. And I, I see the evidence as being equally as uh, compelling. And so I just want to make this a two-way street. What do you mean? So if someone... 2000 years ago wrote down that there is a temple in this location. I mean, they, they, that person obviously knew where the temple was, so they're not predicting anything. They don't know anything about the universe. Uh, they're not like teaching anything about the universe that people didn't know at the time. Everyone already knew there is a temple there. We can literally see it. But if they made a prediction, like there will be a temple built here in a thousand years and they get that right, that would be good. That would be giving us new information about the universe that we didn't know yet. Right. So, well, we can go into fulfilled prophecies because there's over 300 fulfilled right. for actually Jesus of Nazareth himself. And actually one of them was about a temple and a yep. timeline is very, very precise. Yes. We can talk about that later, but let's go back to your squirrel dropping. Oh, right. So that's the claim I'm making is that if you're making a future prediction, like, like prophecy, that, that would count as evidence. I totally count that as evidence. If there are actually fulfilled prophecies, yes, that would be as evidence for the Christian God under my perspective. I don't think writing about a temple counts as a fulfilled prophecy because it has to be something about the future, something we don't know yet. And they, and they already knew the temple right. was there. So that's the oh, difference. I, I, that's... I think I think maybe the, the misunderstanding here is I'm not talking about uh, a, a prophecy when it comes to the temple being recorded in the Bible. What I'm saying is that the authenticity of the stories, the authenticity of David actually existing, the authenticity of him actually having a temple – not being discovered until I believe 2018 is when they, they found his temple. And it was because they were reading scriptures and they, they read it in a, in a new fresh light and thought, oh, this is actually on the other side of Jerusalem. So they, they started digging there and they found it. And so uh, you made a, a, an erroneous uh, 
connection between um, the author of Harry Potter saying, oh, well, she's writing about something that actually exists because, you know, well, so that means, you know, the magical, whatever it is, I've never read Harry Potter is true. No, what I'm saying is that everybody knows that those things in Harry Potter exist already. They're not looking for them. What I'm saying is that when something is in here and we don't know where it is, if somebody goes out and looks for it and finds that, then that would affirm what the Bible is actually saying in the fact that those stories, when it comes to names, dates, places, or the archaeological finds, were indeed actually true. And the people that were in those stories probably existed. And so there wouldn't be a very strong evidence to say, oh, well, since archaeologists have been discovering all of this thing, we've even found, what is it? I think it's the, the, the Tel Dan Steel, which is basically like a, a, a large uh, marble slab. And it actually talks about David as a king. And so these are just really cool things that we're finding that keep affirming the narrative. And so uh, archaeology, I think, is a slam dunk when it comes to uh, a lot of these stories actually existing. Now, if you attribute you know, all of the divine nature that took place in the stories, now that's a different question. That's a completely different question. But I think, you know, the fact that we found Goliath's hometown, we know where Davis is, David's palace was, people have mentioned him. I, I, would, I would venture to say that the story of David and Goliath probably happened. All the miraculous stuff, though, then that would be a different question. Um, but I would say that the, the names, dates, places, and people are pretty solid. Oh yeah, for David, for sure. I totally agree. David, there's lots of evidence David existed. So yeah, the, the evidence of his temple and those things, definitely evidence he existed. I, those don't exist for Moses or Abraham or Isaac or Cain or Abel. Definitely, there's there's lots of characters in the Bible that do are real people, for sure. Granted. Mm -hmm. But there are also lots that aren't. So I go with right. the consensus, and the consensus is absolutely right. David definitely existed, but Moses didn't. So so I totally, I grant that as evidence, for sure. The the archaeological evidence of David's temple and the the towel steel thing, the towel tablet mentioned him, yep, absolutely evidence he existed, for sure. I totally grant that. Great. Yeah. So you just need more evidence for Moses and yeah. And yeah, I'll, that's totally fine. I can give you more later, but oh, okay, cool. So let's, let's continue with your squirrel analogy. Yeah. So, so what makes a good hypothesis is one that can tell us something about the world, like the archeology span or like the squirrel droppings. If it can give us predictions, then that's a good way to show this hypothesis is better than the alternative, like that David didn't exist or whatever. So right. in the case of the origin of life, we've have two hypotheses, either one, it's intelligent design or one, it's caused by natural processes. And the reason we go with the natural processes is because it's made tons and tons of these predictions. For example, we said that if we can see, if life comes about by natural processes, we can see RNA being formed and molded on clay on its own in, in a natural field. And we've discovered, oh, we, we do see that. We can see that occurring. And we, did, we predicted that, well, if life needs a cell, a, a encapsulable kind of thing. And we can see if that occurs naturally, we should be able to see it in these kinds of environments. And oh, look, we, we also see that happening on the same clay for the RNA. Um, and we think, that, well, if we need life coming from non-life, we need some single cell organs going to multicellular organisms. So it needs to happen in some kind of a natural environment. And, oh, look, we see that in algae. We can, we can see, we've seen it in a lab where life can go from single cell to multicellular organisms. So in the naturalistic hypotheses, if we just look at it, we just discovered DNA yesterday, it looks really complex, like, yeah, all codes we see are made by a mind, uh, this is a code, therefore this is made by a mind, that's a reasonable argument. But then if we start looking at the discoveries, it seems that, well, these guys over here who thought it was not a mind, they, they seem to be getting a whole lot right that the design people aren't getting right. So it seems like the fact that they've been able to make testable predictions shows that the life from non-life, the abiogenesis hypothesis is significantly more supported because it's the one making progress. It's the one who has the archaeological evidence for David and the uh, intelligent design one has none. It's never produced any novel predictions as far as I'm aware. And that's why the consensus in biology is yay, biogenesis, RNA world hypothesis. These things are the, are the most supported hypotheses. Obviously we haven't proven the origin of life yet, but the most supported one with evidence is the one with the, the archaeology like David. So, I, so that would be why we go from life to non-life. You also mentioned, um, 
laws come from a lawgiver. Well, I, I, that doesn't really make sense in science. N none of the scientific laws come from a lawgiver. They're just descriptions of the way the world works. So Newtonian gravity is a description of how gravity operates on large bodies in a solar system. Uh, Einstein's general special relativity, same thing. It's a more accurate version. Uh, the laws of thermodynamics, those weren't made by a person. Those were descriptions of how energy transfers through a system. Like none of the laws of science are made by people. They're just things that describe reality. Uh, laws made up by man obviously are made up by people. Laws from a, a judge or, or a, you give a, a speed sign uh, example. Yeah, those are definitely man-made and those are subjective, non-objective laws. All of the objective laws are not made by minds. They're just part of reality. And so when, when I say morality is like a law of nature, I think it's an objective law like gravity. It applies to everything, everywhere, all across the universe. It's not like a subjective law like human man-made laws where we just say, speed limit is 45, you can't go faster than that or you'll get a ticket. Um, mm -hmm. So I think morality is more like the objective kinds of a laws, like a law of nature, like gravity, not like the subjective kind that humans are made. Um, you mentioned information. Information is... Information theory was invented by uh, Claude Shannon in 19, I think it was 58 or 64 when he wrote his paper on information theory. And information is simply, can be produced by any statistic system. So information comes about by natural processes, just by definition. Like of every definition of information, both Shannon information and Kalgamorov information, they come about by natural processes all the time. Um, can you give one example? Dice produce information. So just literally any stochastic system. How are dice a natural... So, phenomena don't, don't they already contain oh, information on them from an intelligent design <laughs> so okay uh well there's yeah. rocks falling on a beach leaves information like the, the rock falls it leaves an indent of the rock on a beach the indent leaves information about the particles in the rock about the weight of the rock the speed of the rock um waves push push pushing up on a beach leave information when the sediment right. from the, the waves hit the beach and leave grow crystals that leaves information crystals leave create information like literally every sure. every natural everything situation. is information so i think what you're doing right now is you're actually uh conflating your definition between information and usable code and so yeah like an indentation is you it's going to produce data we can measure it and we can go out there and be like oh look we're getting information from this but that information isn't actually existing in anything that is usable or tangible a rock isn't using that information to to, to figure out how deep that hole is you need a mind to come in and actually measure the indentation that the rock made in order to collect that data then what we do is we take that data and then turn that into usable intelligible information that perhaps you know an engineer could use if they're building a, a, a stone house. And so I, the, the thing that you're saying is true. Yeah, there are crystals, there are rocks, there is information that is happening, but none of that information is possible to be turned into coherent data that it is then usable, which becomes the, the true type of information that leads to code processes that run our entire uh, like biological systems. And so what do you, like, what do you mean I, I get where you're coming from, so, for example, like the the example I gave earlier of RNA building on clay, it takes the building blocks of RNA and forms it on the clay. So it takes the non-information of just the rocks. What, what takes it? The, the, I, I've never heard about this study. So, like, true. I think this is fascinating that RNA is, is being formed on clay. So it takes the proteins and the proteins bond with a part of the clay and then they bond together and it forms the RNA into a usable code, it's into an RNA strip so that it can then produce more RNA and start to replicate. So it takes the non-information of just the jumbled proteins and then it folds them into a thing that can then build more stuff. So, But what what is it and this thing? I, uh, I've never so heard the of clay, this before. The clay is the foundation. It's like it's the the blueprint, essentially. It's just, it's just not, it's not like humans made this. It's just a piece of clay. The shape of the clay causes the proteins of the, the RNA to bind to the clay and then when they bind to the clay, they build on themselves to create a structure. So the, the RNA is binding to the clay, and then more RNA molecules bind to the other RNA molecules and build a long strand of RNA that's just forming on the clay. It's just it's like using the clay as like a something to lean up against, to, 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 to attach to. And so it takes this non-information of just the proteins and then combines them together to build the information. The Because RNA is a precursor to DNA. RNA is the, the literally the code, the code that makes other stuff. And so if the RNA then goes from this non-information state to this information state and can then be used to make other RNA molecules. That is literally what you're saying can't occur uh, or doesn't occur naturally of information. Well, this, sounds like, this sounds like a leprechaun knocking over a glass. I, what is this even called? 
what is uh, the, I don't know the technical terms for yeah, it. You can I just mean, Google. you keep saying like it takes the proteins and it, it forms its an RNA and then it builds more. It's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. It sounds like a mythical uh, thing. Well, I, this I has mean, been proven in the lab. The We've of... literally observed this. So, so it's, it's, there is a well, piece there's of clay. probably a name for it. Yes. We could probably. You can just Google <laughs> RNA on clay. It'll first thing RNA on clay. Okay. Yep. I'll have to do my research on this, but I'm going to, I'm going to say totally debunked right now on this whole thing. Um, another thing that, you haven't proven, and you've made a large claim. You've claimed that um, all laws, natural laws, physical laws, actually don't come from intelligence. And so, what is what evidence do you have for that? Because when I look at all laws, when I look at life, when I look at code, when I look at how the universe works, when it comes to every single situation. Everything comes from an intelligence of some kind or life begatting life. Uh, and so I would extrapolate that if the first cell, you know, was going to come into existence, it would have to come from some sort of life or intelligence because every other living cell that we have seen on the planet, when it comes to our parents, when it comes to even, you know, animals or fungi or whatever, it's it's always life giving to life, and so whenever we see laws or we see uh, information, when we see uh, usable code that's applicable, it always comes from some sort of intelligent application in every field. And so when it when we back it up to the beginning of the universe, all of a sudden, poof! Now we can just say, well, well, none of those laws, none of that information comes from anything. Yeah, that's science. Well, what, what, what evidence do you have that you can show that gives even one grain of support that all of that complexity can be pulled out of chaos and grow? Like one line of evidence. Well, I just gave you one. So the RNA and clay has been proven definitively. It is the consensus. I've already debunked that one. No, I've never haven't. heard of it. Okay, the so fact that you've never one. heard of it doesn't debunk it. So, so no, this is a proven but you scientific can't explain fact. It. You don't even know the name of it. <laughs> the, the fact I know a name you can't, you can't of it, RNA use, on clay. You can't use that as evidence if you don't RNA even know. RNA on it. clay, Harvard EDU, a role of clay in formation of the first cells. I just debunked you. So I just Googled well, you this. You gave me nothing. What are we looking at? Harvard.edu. Harvard.edu. A, a role for clay in the formation of the first cells. RNA origins on sheet, no, the, oh, so this RNA, is RNA. This is like groundbreaking for me. I've never even heard <sighs> of the first cells being made. No, no, no. It, see, RNA is some, a precursor to cells. RNA makes DNA, DNA makes proteins. There, there's a sequence there. So you start with RNA. RNA forms on clay. RNA right. origins in a sheet of clay. Uh, oh, here, here it is. It's the, the fancy name you were looking for. Montemorillonite's catalyzed formations of RNA oligomers. There you go. All right. I'm going to, well, it, just because you came up with a fancy name doesn't mean that the study is true. I mean, Francis, uh, uh, what did those guys do? The, the guys who, was Collins, it Francis Crick? Collins, no, it was Francis the Collins. Ure Miller experiment. Those guys created chains of amino acids, but they were messing with the conditions for the early earth. I mean, if, if, if they're, well, the, wait, wait, the, wait. We, we don't, we don't care about the early earth here. All we care about can life come from non-life? It doesn't need to be well, the early no, earth. What I'm, what I'm saying is that those guys totally faked their experiment. They weren't creating, they weren't creating the um, amino acids that they said they were making in an honest way. That what they were doing is they were running the experiment. Then they were filtering them out because there was a tar substance that would actually break down the, um, the amino acids that they were trying to produce. And then they released their findings. And so the thing about it is like this clay thing, this seems like amazingly fantastical. I would have to read through it and see if what they're doing is, is, is similar to what the Miller Ure experiment was where they're like, like putting RNA on clay and then adding all these different things to it. And then here's, here's the claim right here. Let's just say this is true. Let's just say that the clay RNA is like totally legit. So we've got a bunch of RNA. Now what? What happens? Like, how do you get RNA to you and me? Like, that is 
how do you get RNA even to a one single cell? I mean, I could give you a healthy single cell, a stromatolite, one of the most basic rudimentary organisms on the planet, okay? I could give you that cell and we could slice the cellular wall. You would have everything out and open and available for it to all come together. And guess what? It won't. It will die. That cell, RNA being by itself, and then let's say you could somehow figure out how to get DNA and uh, mitochondria and, and a cellular wall. Like, how is that even? No, it's like having the parts for something uh, doesn't even lead to one functioning cell ever. And we can take functioning cells, take them apart and have all the fresh parts to it. It's never going to become a living cell. And so even if I haven't researched this clay thing, it looks pretty lame. It looks like it's going to be debunked pretty quickly. But even if we did have RNA, then what? Then RNA would make DNA and DNA would make proteins and the proteins would build cell walls and then you'd get a cell. That's, yeah. It's literally the RNA it world hypothesis. Totally, yeah, it's the opposite of entropy, which is a scientific fact. This is so irrational, man. What do you mean the opposite of entropy? Because it's not in any way the opposite of entropy. Entropy is basically complexity going to non-complexity. We have a, a thermal no. dynamic universe and we're going towards a dead non-thermally dynamic universe. We have literally that everything is aging. We're going from order to disorder. Like I don't know the exact definition of entropy, but I've given a pretty good synopsis of it. And well, what you're entropy, saying- Entropy is the second law of thermodynamics that uh, uh, that a system will go from order to chaos. Or from, right, so, that's exactly so, what I'm saying. So, so but you're, wait, 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 you're so, saying it's gonna uh, go from chaos to the order of a functioning single cell. Yes, yeah, so what we have in entropy wow. is that when you have an energy, when you have energy like the Big Bang, and the Big Bang causes these particles to start to form like hydrogen and helium, and those particles gravitate together from gravity and form these things called stars and these stars emit energy in the form of mm -hmm. electrons and heat and that energy then hits a planet like earth mm -hmm. so the the energy from the sun is then transferred into the cells which then builds the order so so all of the energy is still going down this doesn't violate entropy the energy that we're getting we're not generating energy from anywhere we're getting energy from the sun so it doesn't in any way violate entropy because entropy is just that the amount of energy is going to go down and it is because we're not generating energy; we're using it from the sun. So it doesn't it doesn't violate entropy. It when it comes to energy, I would agree. But the the energy from the sun rav, does so much havoc on living cells. And so the the thing you have to think about is you, you're you're postulating that RNA all by itself, right? Then all of a sudden, somehow DNA, which is extremely complex as well mitochondria and then a some a cellular wall it all came because there's like extra energy it's like well this I is mean, just, we just add, about we can, entropy so entropy is the right, second well, law of thermodynamics I'm, that says the level of energy will go down so so to violate the second law you'd have to have the level of energy go up and life does not cause the level of energy to go up so it doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics that's that's the point here for, for sure when it comes when it comes to energy coming from the sun yes we're not worried about that what i'm saying is that we have a, a, this random idea of chaos becoming order and chaos does not become order no matter how much energy you add to it you have to have some sort of mechanism that causes it so let's say you've got this cell right this the cell is amazing it's perfect it's flourishing uh how does it metabolize food I guess it knew that it needed to metabolize food. So then let's say let's say it metabolizes food, it's living its life, but then it dies. But no no no, no, it it knew how to reproduce. It had it had that coding, it had that ability, and then it reproduced before it died and then all those people also know how to metabolize and reproduce and and the information that it takes and the systems in place for just metabolizing food are phenomenally complex. I, I, I'm not seeing the whole clay mud RNA thing producing this, no matter how much energy you put into it, no matter how much time you put into it. Then the luck that this single celled organism that came up out of clay is able to also reproduce. And reproduce is also very, very complicated. And so I, I just don't see how this is going it from this is like chaos to order and it seems irrational it seems completely irrational because we don't see life popping up 
anywhere else. We don't see non-life producing life. We don't see order coming from disorder. We don't see actually usable code and information increasing in a genome. We have different various sizes of genomes, but we don't ever see a complexity or an acquisition of code sequences. We don't, we don't see that. Wait, wait, what do you mean? So, well, the reproduction part I already explained, like RNA can copy itself. That's, that's reproduction. How does it have that ability? Why does it know that Physics. it needs to copy itself? Well, it, so so remember, remember I told you that they bond to the clay and they, they right. form a shape. And uh -huh. then other RNA molecules bond to that RNA molecule, and the same thing. It's like they're like magnets. The the, the mm -hmm. ATCG bond to all opposite ATCGs, and then they break apart. That's that's reproduction. So it's, they don't know anything. It's just physics. They they physically bond in a specific shape, and then they physically break apart in the same physical shape. Mm -hmm. that's, that's so. If it's just that easy, and it's just physics, then why is it that Earth is the only planet that we know of that has life? Um, Don't you think the, the universe should just be packed? Like it's the Fermi paradox, right? Where is everybody? Well, no, I wouldn't think it'd be packed because the Goldilocks zone is actually pretty small. If you take the amount of space that you can actually have life, it's pretty mm -hmm. small. And given that it takes uh, s several billion years for life to evolve to the point where we can generate radio radio waves, no, we probably wouldn't be able to see life um, pretty much anywhere. For the most part, but the universe is much, much, much older than yes. our. What were you like, four point seven billion or something? For the Earth, I mean, yes. What, I mean, there could have been a Goldilocks zone that popped up, you know, tens of billions of years ago somewhere else. Not really. Uh, yeah. Why not? So because I mean, stars didn't form until uh, I think it was five billion years ago, five billion years after the Big Bang. So there's. So you need the stars to form, and then the stars need to form the planets, and the planets need to form atmospheres, and there's a time frame for that, and and so it couldn't have actually happened until within the past four billion years is about the max, and given if they did evolve at those points, they would need to develop technology and then start sending radio waves, and then we would need to be able to detect those radio waves. Mm -hmm. It's not really that surprising. It's like Neil deGrasse Tyson had this great quote. He said, saying that we haven't discovered life in the universe because of what we've discovered is like taking a glass and dipping it into the ocean and filling it with water and saying, ah, oh, there are no whales in the ocean because there's none in this glass. Like the universe is huge and our, and our ability to see it is very, very tiny. We, we don't see that much. We can barely get anywhere in our own galaxy with what we can see, especially with radio waves. So it's not that surprising that we don't see it. And what we do see is that there are there are thousands and thousands of planets in the Goldilocks zone that probably do have life, which is why we're going there to see them. And we have seen all of the building blocks of life in bacteria on asteroids. So it's pretty reasonable. So yeah, life does evolve all over the place. Like we want to search. But well, there's just no supporting Titan. evidence for it. There's just no supporting evidence that life does evolve. Except the fact that we see all of the building blocks for life on asteroids and we see the different parts of life or what we'd expect to see on life on things like moons on Titan, which is pretty close. So sure. we have tons of supporting evidence actually. It's just, I just can't go, I go mountain. I go mountain climbing all the time. I go hiking. I live in Utah now. It's I'm in California. I went hiking a lot and I see building blocks for stone houses everywhere. The building blocks for a stone house on a hike mean nothing. What am I going to do? I'm going to I'm going to come back there in a billion years and there's going to be a, a stone house. So the idea that we have building blocks all over the universe, that we have building blocks on, you know, clay and in RNA, it doesn't mean that anything is going to be built. It's irrational to think that. Well, if you have a whole bunch of self-reproducing molecules being developed, uh, then, yeah, sure. it's pretty reasonable that you, you would see something form and that's that's kind of the argument so the self-reproducing molecules are pretty easy to find they're they're not too terribly hard that's the rna on clay thing we mm -hmm. know of these can occur in at least these sets of environments so it's pretty reasonable to infer they happen in similar environments all across the universe i don't if it, if it can happen in this environment here on earth then it can happen in the same environment on other planets that's that's the evidence we've done it here the environment over there it'll happen over there well, I'm not so sure about the whole RNA and clay thing. I haven't studied it. Um, but the whole building block idea does require some sort of system, some sort of information that is played out in a practical, tangible way 
for things to be built. I mean, when you when you look at the intricacies of the cell and and how proteins are formed, I mean, it it is mind blowing how many systems on top of systems are regulatory. And so to to say, oh, well, I found a bunch of stones and the building blocks of a house on a hike is about the same thing as saying we've found building blocks for certain things on on asteroids or on other planets. Uh, you know, some people believe that there might be liquid water on Mars if we can find it. it. Like, wow, liquid water. Okay, well, well, great. That that means absolutely nothing. That means that that water is an essential for life, but it doesn't mean if we find water, there's going to be life. And so I, I I find the 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 clay RNA like building block idea as being completely unsupported by what else we can see in the world. Nothing arranges itself into complexity. It just doesn't happen, especially biological life. I mean, that's that's what Louis Pasteur set out to, to show. I mean, obviously, uh, we're talking a little bit deeper into RNA, but life does not come from non-life. And having building blocks means nothing unless you have a builder to build those blocks together. Right. That's kind of the point of the whole RNA thing is that's literally the code. That's literally usable information. That's literally a, a actual code of DNA. The same thing, literally the same code being made on clay, which then causes it mm -hmm. to self-reproduce. So that's literally debunking you, the argument. And Louis Pasteur well, said that, that, that mice would come out of just fermenting hay. So, so spontaneous generation isn't really, really relevant there because, yeah, we, we don't think that mice are going to spontaneously pop out of fermenting hay. Okay, so um, RNA, DNA, genetic codes are species-specific. I have, I have 3.2 billion base pairs in my genome. I'm sure you do as well. We're homo sapiens. So what, what species is this RNA that's on this clay? I mean, it, what I, I just I, I keep hearing that RNA keeps showing up and it's just so easy for self-replicating molecules to, you know, increase in complexity. But I just don't find that to be supportive evidence. I think the biggest supporting evidence that uh, an atheist has is going through the Bible and saying, "Up, oh, I don't like that about the character of that God. I don't like that about the 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 mythicalness of that miracle. I don't like that about you know me being called to this you know spiritual religious life and following Christ. And so I think it's it's the biggest evidence that an atheist really has is not supporting evidence. It's actually just discounting things they don't like about all of the supporting evidence for Christianity. Uh, what supporting evidence? So again, I, I go with the consensus of experts in every academic field here. That's, that's my baseline. I go with what the experts actually understand about the, the evidence. So they, they get, they're the ones who determine, is this really evidence or is this not evidence? Not just random YouTube atheists like myself. So when we look, we're talking about evidence for God. Like I agree that God is the God of the old Testament is clearly immoral based off of all the people he killed. And, and that I would say would be a good argument that he is not a moral God, it wouldn't necessarily be an argument he doesn't exist. It wouldn't would be evidence he doesn't exist. Unless, why, why is killing people immoral? Um, I believe in objective morality. It's an involuntary imposition of will, so it is by definition immoral. Um, well, I, I think you're about half right. Um, killing might be immoral. I know murder is definitely immoral. So killing an innocent person for no reason... Uh, the death penalty, for example, is not immoral when it comes to um, the the law in the Bible, uh, because they're not an innocent person. And so, when it comes to somebody who has violated a moral code, then we have to say, if it is objective, then then give me give me the concrete, uh, unchangeable objective moral law that you claim there is, because it kind of seems like your objective rules change whenever it shifts your argument. So are we going with the objective morality of the Ten Commandments? Are we going with a different objective morality that everybody could subjectively weigh into? Like what, where is your immutable, unchangeable objective moral law? Where, where can I study this? Um, the same way you study any scientific fact, you look at the phenomenon and plot out the pattern, describe it with the principle and make predictions. So my, my immutable, unchangeable law is any involuntary imposition of will is immoral. It is always that is always going to be the answer. So I think. How do you test that scientifically? Uh, you, you said it's a, 
Yes. So, so moral naturalism, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, you can, you can go through the complex stuff there. Uh, it's pretty much, you look at the evidence. So moral intuition, moral progress, those are the things we're just talking about with morality. We say, well, what is the pattern in these? I think the pattern is in any, any involuntary imposition of rules are wrong. If I'm right, I can make predictions about how moral intuition and moral progress will change over time, which is what I do. And if I get those right, then that's good evidence. My hypothesis and my understanding is correct. So it's yours. I'm just I'm just trying to find the objective one that is standard that we can study and all kind of unite around and be like, okay, this is the objective truth. Right. So objective morality isn't solved in philosophy. It's kind of like dark matter and dark energy. We don't know with 100% certainty what the answer is. We have a bunch of different theories and whichever theory gets the evidence right is the best one. Kind of like Newtonian uh, general and special relativity. It's like you, you look at the evidence, mm -hmm. make a prediction, and if it gets it right, then your model is correct. So everybody is looking at the evidence, trying to make predictions, and we're waiting to test those to see which one is right. We right. So what I'm what I'm saying is that your claim that God is immoral, so therefore you know you don't like him, right? And then therefore he doesn't exist because you don't like him, right? Well, no, no. Remember, I said that that does that doesn't prove he doesn't exist. It just proves he's immoral. Okay. So immoral according to your standard. Yes. Right? Drowning babies is immoral. God drowned babies. God is immoral. Right. Well, that's that's your standard of morality. Yeah. So when when you place your standard of morality right against anyone, what you're doing is you are becoming God. You are becoming the the judge and the jury and the executive. You're saying what is bad and what is immoral. Right? No. So so that's again, what you just said no, no, no. You, so you just, so it's like you just claimed that drowning babies is immoral according yes. to your moral standard, and so therefore God is bad because he drowned a baby. So so again, this is like a scientific law. It's like Newton had a theory of gravity, Einstein had a theory of gravity, but they weren't their subjective theory. They're they're referring to something in reality. We test these against reality. It's not it's not mm -hmm. like Einstein's theory of general relativity is subjective and it's just his opinion. Like, no, it's it's right. a thing that he makes. He's claiming about reality. It's a thing that exists in reality, independent of any mind. Do you All believe in global warming? Yes. So then drowning babies would be morally good. We need to get rid of the carbon producers. No. No. The so how do you how do you scientifically test that 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 drowning babies is morally wrong? How do you uh, you look at you look at the evidence of moral intuition, moral progress, you plot out the evidence, you make a principle, and you make a prediction of where it's going to be in, say, a thousand years. That would be how. Okay. So how do you justify the Holocaust? I, I don't. It's immoral. But it wasn't immoral at the time. It was always the people immoral. Who, it's always immoral. It, so it was always immoral. Yep. So according to what standard? That any involuntary imposition of will is immoral. Any involuntary Imposition. Imposition yes. of someone else's will is immoral. Yes. So being born is immoral. No. That's that. Well, I, by your definition, I did not will myself to be born. I did not want to be born. That yeah. was immoral of my mother. So if you did not want to be born and then she birthed you, yes, that would be an imposition. I don't think you had that desire. When, I did not when ask. Were, well, so, so an imposition is when you will something and someone stops you from getting it, essentially. It's not, it's okay. not like... Your will so, being created was not an imposition. So the United States government and the allies defeating Hitler was immoral. Uh, no, it was the least immoral action. So it's the so he wanted immoral. to continue ruling. That was his will, and we no. imposed upon his will in order to protect the other wills. So so then there's so, so there's a sliding scale of kind no, of no, like no, no, no. so so to clarify here, it's like putting okay. people in prison is immoral. Like we if we could there we could not do it, that would be good. But we have to do that to protect the greater harm that would be caused if we didn't put them in prison. So, so there's uh, an option so here. We greater have, harm thing. Yes. Yeah, so so there, we do one slightly immoral action by putting people in prison to prevent the greater immoral action of the people dying if we don't put them in prison. But we do know that there's a better option there. Like if we, if we were a god and had all powerful or whatever, we could just essentially give everyone a personal force field and then we wouldn't need to put them in prison anymore. And so we wouldn't do so. So we can know that... It's not the objectively moral thing to do to put people in prison or to essentially kill Hitler or whatever. The objectively moral thing to do would be to give everyone a personal force field so that Hitler couldn't hurt them. Because if Hitler couldn't hurt anybody, we wouldn't need to kill him or put him in prison anymore. So obviously killing him isn't the moral thing to do. It's just the thing we have to do based off of our limitations. The moral thing to do would just be to give everyone a personal force field. So it doesn't there's no sliding scale well, how do you come to that how do you come to that conclusion that the moral thing to do would be to give everybody a personal force field that doesn't seem very objective 
uh, what, what do you mean that's not objective? So, so the objective thing to do is the action that causes the least involuntary imposition of will. If we can give everyone their own personal force field and make it impossible for any person to impose on their will, that would do that. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas opposed to if we put Hitler in prison or kill him, that's an imposition on his will. So that would be worse than giving everyone a personal force field, which has no imposition of will. And then we'd have a bunch of losers on this planet. I, you, you probably don't have kids. Do you have kids? No. Okay. So I impose my will onto my children constantly because – Kids are dumb. They will sit around and eat candy all day. They will run into the street and get hit by a car, and the car isn't trying to impose their will. I need to impose my will upon my children on a regular basis in order for them to grow in character so they're not losers or idiots or they don't kill themselves. So this whole idea of this personal force field where nobody can impose their will upon another person is absolutely false. Our society would fall apart, and it's, there's no objective truth to this whatsoever. I would go as far as to say that we need good people people to actually impose their wills upon other people who haven't figured things out yet to help them along the way to build their character so that they could be a decent human being. And so I just think that it's impossible to raise a child. It's impossible for you to even be raised without your will being positively imposed upon in a way that actually improved your life. And I could probably name a thousand times when I imposed my will on my kids that was 100% beneficial and totally not immoral. I would think that's kind of easy to disprove. So for example, if we lived in a world where no one could be harmed, like if you couldn't be run over by a car, then there's no reason to stop your kids from running into the street. <laughs> This is totally not an objective standard because anytime I say something, you add another thing. And so it's like, okay, your first definition was we can't impose on somebody's will. It's the same definition, like, always the same right. definition. It's always, yeah, but that definition doesn't work. So then you had to add, well, we, you have to look at the, the greater no, no, good. No, that's, that's the, the same definition. So, for example, if you okay. have two options, like the trolley problem where you can have a right. train run over one person or five people, both of those are immoral. They're, they're still immoral. But you pick the one with the less one because it's pragmatic. It's still immoral. It's just, it's just less so immoral than the other one. Accidents are immoral. Like just uh, any harm happening at, at all is yes, just immoral. Yes, a better world wow. would be one where that doesn't happen. And no accidents. Possible. Yes. That is a really better irrational world. way to look at the world. How is that it's a, extremely uh, irrational. We just don't... We just, okay, how is so that irrational? Because irrationality so means basing, corresponds to logic. So there's no... So you're no, basing that God is immoral because you want to live in paradise no yeah, i'm saying that's, god is immoral. essentially what you're saying no it's not because i didn't okay, say anything about explain paradise. it better i said god well, no, is immoral. there's no accidents we all have a personal force field uh nobody gets hurt uh, accidents are immoral uh you know sadistic acts are also immoral uh infringing on somebody's will even if it's benefiting their character uh is immoral i mean I, it seems like a you like a false utopian paradise that just won't ever exist, and so therefore God is immoral, and then you don't like him, and he's not real. Yeah, I don't think you're following the argument here. So one, all of this I said is possible. None of this is all of this is possible with human technology. So if God can't do it, God is just inept. Secondly, nothing I said is illogical. I mean, illogic means there's a, there's a logical contradiction, like a square circle. Nothing I said is illogical. So whether or not it's what we can do today in today's world doesn't make it not objective. Like the objective speed of light is the speed of light. Whether or not we can actually travel at it makes no difference at all. And this is clearly more immoral. So, so clearly immoral to impose on someone's will. Drowning babies is immoral. God drowned babies, God is immoral. A world without that would be objectively more immoral. You can disagree. You can say drowning babies isn't immoral. And then I'm just going to appeal to the intuition of everyone who's watching and say, well, if you think drowning babies is immoral, you're probably on my side on this argument. And then we can just wait. Well, I'm, not the val I'm not validating the morality of drowning babies or not. What I'm saying, I'm, I'm looking at the argument. Right. And then the argument is God drowned babies and that's immoral. And so if you think drowning babies is immoral, then you'd be on my side. That was, was kind of the point. So it's clearly a better world if we didn't have involuntary vision. Well, like all of the cases with your kid, the kid's example, that's a great one. If you didn't need to impose, the only reason it's okay to impose your will on your kids is because if you didn't, then there's going to be a greater consequence on their will later in nature. Like if you don't stop them from running into the street, they'll be hit by the car. But we know that's not the objective moral thing to do because there's a moral, moral thing you can do. If we lived in a world where there isn't, it's not possible for them to be hit by a car, 
well, then you don't need to stop them from running to the street anymore. So all of those examples of you imposing your will on your kid are only pragmatic. They're not moral. They're something you need to do, the lesser immoral action, to prevent a greater immoral later, like putting someone in prison. It's not the good thing to do. It's just mm -hmm. the best you can do given your limitations. The best moral thing to do would be make it so that if we live in a world where it's physically impossible to impose on someone else's will if they don't consent to it. And that doesn't make it a utopia because you can still consent to it. You can still consent to, to being hurt if you want to. You can consent right. to playing hard video games that, that give you pain. You can consent to being punched if you want. So it doesn't get rid of those things. It just makes them consensual only. Uh, and secondly, again, this is possible. Like once we gain enough technology, we will be able to do this here on earth. So I don't know why you think it's irrational. Well, or... you know what? I, I do have to say, I do agree with you that there is, there is a desire that we all have to live in a world like that. And, you know, to not have cars driving by, you know, not imposing on people's wills to have kind of this utopian society. We, we, we all long for this. And I think what you're really doing is, is you're longing for the garden of Eden before the fall. And so like, if we could, if we could make the garden of Eden without that pesky tree of knowledge of good and evil, then that would be exactly what you're explaining because there'd be no reason for trucks because we wouldn't need to be shipping our food. We could just be eaten off of trees and no trucks would be driving by where I'd have to impose my will upon my kid because there'd be no accidents. And the reason why you have that desire is the same reason why people have been striving for paradise, been striving all of human history. We've all been looking for that perfection, that, that paradise that we, that we want. And I think the most accurate description of the human heart is what is described in the Bible. We, we all are longing for paradise lost. We all know that there's something wrong with death. We all know that there's something wrong with accidents and morality. We all have this code that has been written on our hearts that we're, we're fe we, like, we might not be able to all objectively describe it the same way, obviously. But, you know, it says in uh, Jeremiah that God has written the laws of God on our hearts. And so we do have this objective morality, this ex objective, objective desire to live in a utopia. And I think that's the the basis of the gospel is that we we lost that due to the fact that we do impose our will on other people. We we do think that our way is the right way. And when we choose to go our way, we're actually going against what is the way that we are created to be. And so Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. He said, "Follow me." So Sin isn't this like mysterious, you know, religious philosophical idea. Sin is basically just saying, you know, my will be done instead of thy will be done. And so that's why the world has crumbled. When you look at people who have decided to put their life into making a better society, you know, like communism, for example, there's not a single example of communism obtaining their utopian society. It always crumbles. Why? Because you can't get rid of the broken human condition in a utopia. So we can have technology in the future someday that can help us with this stuff, but you're never going to be able to help us with our broken hearts and our broken conditions. And that's the cool thing about the gospel is that Jesus says, hey, listen, I created the universe. I created you with intention, and I know you have these longings, and someday I'm going to come back with a new Jerusalem and guess what? There's not even going to be a temple in the New Jerusalem it, because people's hearts are going to be focused on God. We won't need uh, a penal system. We won't need any type of law enforcement because Jesus will come back and he will be the king and he will rule and reign in our hearts. And we won't impose on other people and we will be living in that utopia we all desire. And that's the hope. That's the good news. Like the gospel is good news. And so, yeah, we can come up with all these reasons why we don't want God or 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 we want to be atheists, we want to deny his existence, but all of our desires are all the same. Like if you and I sat down and we talked about the desires that we want for our life, for the future, for morality, we'd probably come up with some of the same stuff. Well, except I, I wouldn't, our sources would be different. Well, I wouldn't I don't know if I would agree with that. Well, I think lots of people have lots of different definitions of what they find pleasurable. Uh, but my contingent here is that, so there's two models. You have a model of what counts as, a, we, we agree there's objective morality. We, we, we agree on that. Well, you, we haven't actually. 
Uh, you say you agree of objective morality, but your morality is very slippery. You don't. You, no. I can't. Study, I can't study your objective morality. I could. I could give you yes. my objective morality right here. No, you can't actually it, study my objective. I've written it in a book, which is far better than the Bible, and that's that's the point I'm making here. Well, so, no, 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 no. But that's 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 your idea of objective morality. It's subjective to you. It's right, not. Right, and you objective. have your subjective idea of what you think morality is in the Bible, and this is this is oh, the no. point here. Wait, wait, wait. So, so no, no, this I'm, is the point here. We're I trying can say to the figure out. So, are so the ultimate. We're, we're trying to figure out which one is actually correct. So you have an opinion. I have an opinion. Which one is better? Your God drowns millions of babies. I say that's wrong. Your God kills people, turns them into salt for looking the wrong direction. I say that's wrong. So if we're looking at the evidence of, well, if we take these actions, which ones are right, which ones are wrong, it seems my get, mine's get it right more often than yours. So mine's more likely to be the objective basis than yours. That's the claim here. So because mine actually gets the answer right and actually does describe what the objective utopia would be like and yours does not, then mine is actually more likely to be objective. Mine has more evidence than yours. That's, that's the claim. Um, so I, di I didn't hear any evidence for yours. I, I heard a lot of things you don't like about mine and I could go into all those things, but, but what is, what is one piece of supporting evidence for yours? Drowning babies is objectively immoral. So, so if no, I'm no, no. So, so now, now you're ripping on something you don't like about the Bible and we haven't even talked about which verse that is. And even if that was the context that we're talking about. So tell, give me one supporting evidence. Don't talk about my God or my book or, you know, the, the Judeo Christian faith. Give me supporting evidence that, that your moral objective code is supported. Okay, when we're talking about evidence for a moral code, what we do is we give an example of a moral act and we say, does this moral code accurately portray that moral act as being moral or immoral? If it gets it right, then that's good evidence for the moral hypothesis. If it gets it wrong, that's bad evidence. So if you have an example like drowning babies and this model says that's moral, that model is probably wrong because it takes the moral action and it gets it in the wrong category. Okay, so you're doing it again. Well, no, no, this is what this is how moral philosophers talk about philosophy. In order to assess if one moral system is correct or incorrect, what you do is you take a whole bunch of lists of moral actions and you mm -hmm. see can this moral system accurately describe the morality of those actions? If it can, that's a good model. If it can't, that's a bad model. So, mm -hmm. so what counts as evidence for a moral system is you list a whole bunch of actions like is drowning babies moral? Is killing Hitler moral? Is is what should we do in the trolley problems? Pull the switch or not pull the switch? And you take the model and how it answers these questions to assess whether it's a good model or not. So, so one of the examples I'm using is the drowning babies one. Is drowning babies immoral? In my model, my model says yes. In the Old Testament model, the Old Testament model says God can do that and is totally fine. So clearly, depending on what we do to assess this, it seems that that answer is the wrong answer for the for the Christian Bible. So, so it got morality wrong, so it can't be the objective standard, whereas mine seems to get the answer right on that one, which is drowning babies is immoral. That's, that's how we assess evidence. Okay, all right. So now explain to me um, how the God of the Old Testament got the moral objective code wrong. It drowned millions of babies. And explain. And that's that's immoral. And and what was the context? Where is this from? What is this? Uh, the, what, the global the flood. Global flood. Uh, okay. The context. What what else were you on it for? Like so during right. the global flood, God did not like what the humans were doing, so he drowned the world and killed everyone. Mm hmm. Yes. Right. That, that's immoral. Um. That is not immoral. Well, yeah. That's, that, that's the point I'm making. So you think it's not immoral to drown millions of babies? I think it is. And so if we're assessing these two models, well, it seems like... You're, you're the one who's putting words in my mouth. And what I would suggest doing is actually looking at the context. Because I, I, I get the global flood where you know it, it, it kills people, right? But it, it is not immoral to kill people. It is immoral to kill innocent people. It is murder is what is immoral. And so... So, so I, were, there, were, there were lots of babies at this point, I'm assuming. And they yes. weren't innocent. Here's the thing that's beautiful about omniscience, okay? So God God struggled with this decision, right? He doesn't he doesn't want to wipe out his creation. But then let's you want to just read it? It's, sure. It's pretty great. So to give you a synopsis of what's happening, let me just see if I can find it here. I know uh, his genealogy is Genesis 10, right? Yes, it was. 
All right. So oh, it's buried in the genealogy. Let me just give you off of my memory here. So the world becomes kind of the my way instead of thy way, like we talked about earlier. People are doing everything that they want to do. So there's no longer anybody who is focused on morality, right? The moral code. People are lying. They are, they are killing innocent people. They are murdering, right? They're stealing from each other. And so God basically finds favor in one man, and that's Noah, okay? And he says that he wants to start over, and he's going to use Noah. So for a hundred years, Noah is preaching and teaching to these people. He's telling them that a flood is coming. He gives them a choice. And so God knows the hearts of every single person, whether they are 100 years old or whether they're a baby. And God determined in his omniscience that the same thing was going to happen in the next 100 years. People were going to be scoffing at Noah, making fun of him, making immoral choices, being raised by scoffers and immoral people. And so like begats like. And so at that point, God decided that the innocent people left on the planet were eight, eight people. Yeah. And so according to a moral code where capital punishment is not immoral, right? Then killing innocent people is definitely immoral. But that's not what happened in this story. And God actually talks about the fact that there is no one left except for Noah. And so that's you know, part of the story where you're like, okay, listen, God is omniscient. If his attributes are truly what he says they are, then I have to subscribe to the fact that he does know my heart. And he does know your heart. And he knows Noah's heart. And there's only, there's only two people in the, in the universe that know my heart, and that's me and God. And so in the case of Noah, I would say that what is happening to everyone here today, God knowing our hearts, he made that decision. And no, he didn't kill innocent people. Okay. So I didn't say innocent people, remember I said babies. So in your model, right. it is moral to drown all of those babies. And in my model, it is immoral. And so if we take the two different moral uh, paradigms and we say, well, what is the correct solution in this situation? Take, take the situation before God drowned the world. What should we do? Uh, God says the best action here is let's drown all of the people, including all the babies. Whereas my solution is give them all personal force fields. It seems like mine is less immoral than, than God's here. It, se it seems like, well, no, because the personal force fields would have been protecting these people who's hearts and minds are depraved and they're going to grow up into adults that are evil and infringing on people's wills. That's what God says. Like there is no one left. And so whether or not like, so I was innocent as a baby, I never committed any sins whatsoever. But as soon as I got old enough, guess what I started doing? I started making choices of my own and I sinned. I, I went my own way. And so either way, I mean, okay, according to your model, would it be okay to kill Hitler as a baby? No. Why not? Because he is a will. It would, saved, it would have saved a ton of Jews. And so according to your model, it would have been better for him to have been killed as a baby. No, no. Again, so I think the best option is give everyone personal force fields. So it's physically impossible for Hitler to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to. So so that's that's the moral solution. The moral solution is make it physically impossible for any person to be able to force any other person to do something they don't consent to. So you could let Hitler live and he would never be able to hurt anybody. They all have a personal force field. That's the moral solution. So, this is so silly. This is silly, man. Like it's okay. You're, you're coming up with like personal force fields and this, that's just not, that's just not where the world is. That's yeah. yeah. Not, God, God's all powerful. He could have done this. This shouldn't be. Yeah. But, but God doesn't like that idea. That's not what he did. He didn't call you and he didn't do it that way. Right. He did it the way that he did and he justified it and he has a reason for it. You just don't like it. Exactly. So, so that's yeah. the point so, is that we, we compare the two models. I don't like paying taxes. I don't like working hard and giving to my government, but that doesn't mean the government doesn't exist. And so you're using the same exact argument. There are things in the Bible that you don't like. And so then you're like, well, therefore, that's not the way that I would have done it. I would have given personal force fields. 
And and so therefore, I'm an atheist. God's not real. It's like, dude, there's so many things in the Bible that I don't like. I don't like it at all. Doesn't mean that the Bible isn't real and God isn't who he says he is. Mm-hmm. You think I really like do you think I like uh, being generous? Do you think I like turning the other cheek? Do you think I like loving my enemies? These are all things that I have to learn to do. I don't like it. And so you've got a head and a heart issue. You don't really have an evidential issue. You, you, well, this, you remember, this isn't, this, I remember I said at the beginning that, I, that uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but remember I said at the beginning that this doesn't prove God doesn't exist. This is just a question about which model is more likely to be an objective model of morality. This is not about God's existence here. This is about what counts as objective morality. So mm-hmm. in my model, there is a better option in this scenario of the global flood that God did not do. And it seems like if, if anyone who would agree with my model that would or who would agree that there was a better option that God did not do would see that, well, that's can't be objective morality because drowning millions of babies clearly not the best option i like dogs is just well you could just poof them out of existence instead of drowning them that would be more moral too so clearly that's one of the worst options you could pick uh global flood worst options compared to who Lit, pretty much anything else you could imagine uh just poofing them out of existence so so not flooding them not drowning them and causing them to suffocate to death you could just snap your fingers and cause them to to disappear uh, that would be better because it's not causing them unnecessary suffering. Giving them personal force fields would cause the least imposition of will, so that would be significantly better. Um, there's there's lots of different options there, but drowning them is clearly not the good one. So so this is and this doesn't say God doesn't exist. God could still exist and could still have drowned all of them. That's perfectly fine. It would just make him immoral. And so you can you can still say God exists according, according to some arbitrary out of the Bible standard. Yes. Drowning babies is immoral. So if God drowned babies, he's immoral. Yes. So, so what you're doing is you're, you're taking, you're making a definition of morality that is outside of God's definition. Yes. And applying it to him. Yes. And so it's not objective then. So you have a subjective morality. Well, no, what makes it objective is if it corresponds to reality. So I've made up a definition, like Einstein made up general relativity, and then if right. it responds to reality, then it's objective. That's 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 what makes it objective. So mm-hmm. if you think a God exists, and you think he is the basis of objective morality, and I think something else is the basis of objective morality, like a law of nature, the, what proves us right is whichever one is correct. Like Which one actually exists is well, what uh, we that, determine. So you're, you're, you're creating a fallacy. So what fallacy? whatever... Whatever is whatever is right is proven right is the one that is correct, but yeah. then you're using your own subjective morality to prove which one is correct. And so what I'm saying is that let's let's make this a two way street. Let's look at the morality of God on something that I believe is the objective morality of of truth, right? And so then we'll apply that to the situation, and then I would be correct. So what you're doing is you're saying that you're correct because your version of morality is correct. And so then therefore you can see, haha, I'm correct. But in reality, you, you're not letting me do the same thing. Well, so no, no, I, 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 to- I totally understand what you're saying here. I, I want right. to clarify that I'm not using circular reason here. What I'm saying is, is we take a neutral example. We take like every single model of morality. What you do is you take random examples like is drowning babies immoral question mark that's that's the example and then my model answers it this way your model answers it this way so i'm not saying that you're inherently wrong here what i'm saying is is that if a neutral party looks at the two answers and says well which one of these seems to be correct uh if they agree with me then they should definitely think that your model is wrong and it seems that most people agree drowning babies is immoral. So most people would think that the God model is probably wrong. So so again, this isn't proving that your God is wrong. I'm not saying that because it's immoral to drown babies in my model, and therefore because it's immoral to drown babies, God is proven to be false. That's not the argument here. The argument is saying we look at how our two models answer the questions, and you just compare those two to see which one you think corresponds to reality based on the best evidence. And it seems like mine does from my perspective, and it seems like yours does from your perspective. And so we just have to leave it up to the audience which one they think more corresponds to reality in that one question. So so again, I'm, I'm not trying to disprove you or not using certain reason here. It's just a comparison between the two worldviews. Right. Oh, for sure. Totally. So then here's the question I have for you. This one, this is, this is probably a rabbit trail we shouldn't be going down, but um, what does your... 
um, standard of morality have to say about um, aborting babies? Yes, also immoral. Babies, anything that is conscious is alive, and so killing it ever is always immoral. So just to clarify, I think putting people to death, even in the case of prisons, is also immoral. I think killing anyone for any reason is always immoral. Okay. So then I noticed you, you slipped in a quick little definition of whoever is conscious. So you believe that it's, it's okay to kill babies until they gain consciousness? I assume, well, I'm just assuming for the point of the argument, they're conscious from the point of conception. Like, I don't know when they oh, get consciousness. Wow. That, this is the first time I've ever had a conversation with an atheist that said that babies are babies from the point of conception. This is, this is awesome. Yeah, I, I don't know when they actually get consciousness. I imagine it's some time when they get some neurological state, but I don't know when that is. So I'll just grant for the sake right. of the argument. Let's just say they're conscious from the point of conception. I can, I can grant that and then it's just wrong to kill them. Wow, that's great. I actually had a conversation with an atheist uh, about a year ago in regards to abortion, and he said that uh, um, babies don't acquire consciousness until they're about two to three years old. And so, that, that's weird. I don't. I don't think that's true. Like, whoa, man. yeah, that's that's a little weird. That's tough. Yeah, because because I think that most animals have consciousness. I think ants, bees, most insects have consciousness. So I think as soon as you get a brain, you're probably going to have a consciousness of some time, some kind. So I think that yeah, I, I'm willing to grant that babies are definitely conscious way before birth. Good. Okay, so we agree on that. Um, so then, are you a vegetarian? No, but I think it's moral to be. So I think I I like cheeseburgers, but I am immoral for eating them, and I grant that, and I should be a vegan, but I like cheeseburgers too much. Right. I used to be vegan too, but I like steak too much. <laughs> All right. So uh, I want to get back to one thing. You said that if I had some evidence supporting fulfilled prophecies that you would concede that that is at least some form of valid evidence Absolutely. towards the authenticity of scripture. Absolutely. Okay. So can I go through a couple with you? Sure. Let's go through one at a time. Okay. So um, in Micah 5.2, the Messiah is prophesied to be born in Bethlehem, which I know that a lot of people think, okay, Jesus knows the scriptures really well. You know, he, you know, would say things to try to fulfill things. He'd go to the temple on certain days. He'd read certain scrolls because it was prophesied. But the one about Bethlehem, it's really difficult, I think, for, for me to have chosen that I was born in Illinois. And so for uh, a prophet to say, hey, this guy is going to be born in a town called Bethlehem, I think that's pretty good evidence. And most scholars would believe that Jesus was in fact born in Bethlehem because of the Roman census that he was traveling there. Uh, well, his parents were traveling there for. That's well, one. a few things. So the Roman census, I think, was fabricated. I don't think it actually happened. I'm pretty sure that's the historical consensus. There was no consensus. No, no one had ever done a consensus like that before. There's no reason to do one. I think that's all fabricated just to make it look like he was. Uh, but could you actually read the uh, the Micah? I think it's like five something. Micah five two. Yeah. Yeah. Let me look it up here for you. <clears throat> Micah. I should have bookmarked it. <laughs> there it is. All right, Micah 5 2. Um, so it says, They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. That, that might be talking about the crucifixion or the scourging beforehand. But you, Bethlehem, uh, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, who is from ancient times. And so there, it's not talking about a regular person here. We're t it's talking about uh, some sort of very special ancient of times person. And, and so Jesus is also referred to as the ancient of days. He also said to the Pharisees that before Abraham, I am. And then they were like, you're not even 40 years old yet. What are you talking about? So, yeah, Jesus claims to be the author and finisher of the faith, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end, the creator of the universe. And then here he is being born in Bethlehem. And there's this really interesting description of it uh, before. I don't remember when Micah lived. It was probably a couple hundred years or so beforehand. It's a good question. So 
uh, one thing I, I'm curious when the foundation of Bethlehem was exactly, or, or in Jesus of Nazareth, I think. When, when, why, why is there a distinction between Nazareth and Bethlehem? Well, when you look into the history, historicity, it seems like a lot of these stories don't actually seem to line up. What happened was, is that people added in things and changed things to make them line up that aren't actually historical. So that prophecy doesn't actually seem to say much other than there's going to be a really powerful person that's going to be born in Bethlehem. Oh, well, the reason why it says, you know, Jesus is from Nazareth and then he was born in Bethlehem is because he actually was from Nazareth and his parents were on a journey. They were traveling and then his mom went into labor and that's why there's no room in the inn and his old little town of Bethlehem. He was born. He, he wasn't, he isn't from Bethlehem. He just happened to be born there. Um, and then just to give you uh, a little credence, I totally agree. Like, the New Testament was written way after the Old Testament. And so, you know, all of these verses and everything, they're copies of copies, they're manuscripts. Like we don't even have an original version of the Bible. Like nobody does. Okay. So the whole idea of like, you know, changing the names and everything to go back like that, um, I think is completely plausible. And so then 100% of these prophecies um, could just be made up or false. But then something amazing happened. And that is in the 1940s, a Bedouin goat herder was trying to find a goat in uh, the caves of Qumran, which is right above the Dead Sea. And he threw a rock into one of the caves to try to scare the goat out. And he heard the sound of breaking pottery and he found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the cool thing about it is that the Dead Sea Scrolls were actually buried 300 years before Christ was born by the Essenes. And so if, you know, the New Testament happens and it's written down that we don't have any copies of anything. So all the way up until the 1940s, yeah, there, I mean, the argument that all of these things could have been refabricated to make them work would have been great. But the only difference between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Bible that we have today is that obviously it was in ancient Hebrew. And so these prophecies are all pretty difficult to discount because now we have this book that was buried 300 years beforehand that now is exactly the same as we have today with the same fulfilled prophecies. So do you want to go into another prophecy? Uh, well, sure. But yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls are actually very different in many ways. And even Matthew 2, 6, I think accounts that prophecy differently. I mean, so the consensus in history is that isn't, that's not a fulfilled prophecy. That's just a vague guess that somebody from this city that is relevant to my story will be very powerful for that to be a prophecy. You'd have to like say in this, in X years, this person will be born or something. Not just say in the future sometime in, like if I said some person will be born from Dallas who will, who will rule the world, like given infinitely many years, like probably. Yeah. But it's not really a great prediction. Like to be a prediction, you have to like say something specific that this person will be born in this number of years will do this something something not just say there will be a powerful person who comes from city x i don't think that counts as a prophecy or at least not not a good one well there's multiple prophecies sure. there's so many that add up after after a while uh let's see here this one is really interesting um all right where is it it is in the book of daniel and all right. So no one understand that this from the time that the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench. But in the times of trouble, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come and destroy the city of the sanctuary, the end will come like a flood and war will continue until the end and the desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven in the middle of the seven. He put an end to the sacrifice and the offering and at the temple, he will put up an abomination that causes desolation until the end of this decree is poured out on him. All right. So Daniel was a prophet who lived hundreds of years before Christ. And here he is predicting 
by increments of sevens, okay? So each one is worth a year, okay? And so when you multiply that out, he says that the Messiah is going to come somewhere before the destruction of the second temple. And then says that the destruction of the second temple is going to happen in the year 70 AD. So here he is predicting the Messiah coming in a window of time before the destruction of the second temple. Then the, the second temple was destroyed. And so there's, there's some timing right there for you. And you can look at it. It's Daniel 9, uh, 25. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, any scholar who's an atheist is going to say, well, no, right? But any scholar who is either a Jew or a Christian and looks at this timeline and says, hey, it looks like it fits. And so I can give you some more prophecies if you want to sure, hear them. Sure, let me, let me address that one first. Uh, I'm looking at the Jewish uh, scholars here um, who specifically discount that. I mean, will Jewish ones say that. I don't think any Jewish person thinks that Jesus was actually fulfilled Messiah there. But oh, Okay, for sure. I mean, I, when I say Jewish people, I, I think of Messianic Jews, like people who actually are legit, like they're you know following all the scriptures. They believe the Old Testament, the New Testament. They believe that the Messiah came. Yeah, so so just the, the Jewish scholars specifically in Israel who look for these kinds of stuff and archaeological ones definitely don't agree, and they interpret those to not... To right. not work, I don't know what any of these words mean, so I don't, I can't explain why. But they definitely don't agree. So, in order to explain the non-fulfillment of Daniel's prediction, most evangelicals identify Daniel's four empires as Babylonia, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. They argue that the symbolism of the statue and the beast fits the interpretation more naturally and straightforwardly than the critical interpretation. I'm just reading a, an article. So, I think, I think any Jew that discounts that that is a prophecy um, really has to look at the hard fact of when the temple was destroyed. And so uh, if they're still waiting for the Messiah to come back before the second temple was destroyed, then who are they waiting for? Because the second temple has already been destroyed. And so it, it's, it starts to become an irrational argument because if Jesus wasn't the Messiah and the second temple is destroyed and the you know Islamic Dome of the Rock is now on top of that temple, uh, what are you gonna do, build a third temple and call that the second temple? Well, no, I think that his genealogy of the temples is incorrect. So clearly our author scenario is counterfactual for the Persian under King Cyrus conquered Medea in 550 BC before conquering Babylonia. So when he talks about the, the ages, the four empires, he got the dates wrong or, or he didn't predict them as they happened in history. So it, it doesn't seem to work if you just look at the, the history of the empires and the number of the empires and when they occurred. They don't line up with Jesus. That's the problem. That's the problem that you're reading off of one uh, anti-Jewish website, anti-Jesus website. Academic source, yes. A an academic source? What's the name of it? Uh, scrolling up. Because scrolling up, scrolling nobody, contests, nobody contests Daniel's prophecies because we all know that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And so you've got to come up with all of this, these other fabricated stories. And they're like, they, they didn't line up. Well, guess what? let's let's just say that the Jews were right in this particular article about, you know, Cyrus or these other Babylonians. Um, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and it says the Messiah would come before the destruction of the second temple. Uh, this is from The Failure of Daniel's Prophecies 2007 by Chris Sandoval. And it's analyzing the text and showing that the the claims that are made of the the wars and things they don't line up historically with the birth of jesus like some of them do yeah like the before the destruction of the second temple definitely if you interpret it that way but not all of the other things he said so he said a lot of things in that uh prophecy some of them were correct some of them were not correct and that would be the argument against it um, well, I don't know who Chris Sandoval is. Is this a, uh, um, I'm sure he's probably an atheist or a Jew and he's got a bend and, and, oh, I just found him. It's called the secular web. And you're like saying this is scholarly. Yeah. They, they publish academic papers. He has, he has nothing in here that is, uh, shows anything that is published 
like where where does he, is he being peer reviewed like none of this stuff yeah those are usually peer reviewed stuff yeah okay on on dude you're going to the secular web website to to prove this stuff like that seems a little dishonest i mean you're going to an atheist website to find something about this okay so that's great i mean you're saying you're saying when you say all scholars um what you're really saying is all scholars on your secular website. No, this is the secular websites just find a resource of the papers. It's a little, it's a little dishonest. It'd be like me going to like a, a, a super hardcore like creationist website and be like, aha, origin of life was wrong, man. Look at all these people on this website. No, th this is a resource. This isn't, this isn't give you a bit of a faux pas on that one. So this is a resource of academic okay. papers. This is, this is not, this is not the, the site itself doesn't publish anything. I, I looked at the site. Yeah, the, yeah, the site itself right doesn't publish right anything. Right it's a You're resource right of papers. So it, it lists right papers published in academic journals from colleges. That That's what this stuff is. It's not the, the, the paper itself doesn't publish anything. The journal itself. So right. like you're, you're finding it through uh, the biased lens of the secular web. So right. they're just going to give you exactly what you want to hear. You're dude, you're in an echo chamber, man. Yeah. If I want to find papers that contradict your point, then the best place to look is pay people it's, who like literally find resources of those things. Right. Yeah. But uh, you can find the consensus on the topics and, and refer them right. to that. This is like, so I'm going to, I'm going to read another one for you. And I want you to tell me, um, what do you think about this? All right. Here it is. This is a good one. Okay. Um, so he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him, but he was despised and he was rejected by mankind a man of suffering and very familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him with low esteem. And surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed and like all sheep we have gone astray each of us has turned to our own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all uh so it sounds like there is a prophet who suffered and was went through suffering i think that's what it, it says right it's essentially every the only things that it predicts is that there is a some kind of a prophet who will go through a great deal of suffering and mm -hmm. understand suffering and that he would be crushed and bruised and go through torture that's pretty typical of suffering mostly i don't i don't mm -hmm. unless he just like fell or something i don't but i don't think that would be what the prediction was making but yes that would normally if you predict that there's someone who's going to go through a lot of suffering usually it entails torture from other people so it seems like the the only things that that prophecy predicts is that there is a guy was a prophet who went through a ton of suffering. Okay. And then um, how do we know it's a, a, a true prophecy or a false prophecy? Uh, well, I would assume that's true because that applies to like 90% of the population on the planet since the beginning of time. Okay. And so then what you're saying is that it does not point towards this overarching theme of a Messiah. Because you're just saying, you know what, we're going to have all these prophecies that kind of talk about the same stuff over and over and over again of this suffering servant that's going to be coming, that is going to bear our iniquities, our transgressions, that's going to be bruised and despised. And so then the the whole overarching theme of redemption for the Bible, you're just going to be like, well, it's it's just a coincidence that all these are pointing to the same idea. I don't... Uh, well, no, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that that's true of literally every religion pretty much throughout history is that you have a group who rises up and then that group is persecuted and then the leader is usually tortured or killed. That's pretty much true of most religions and most stories about religions throughout most of history. So I don't see that as special. Yeah. The only difference is um, 
we've got Jewish archaeology that points to the authenticity of the rivers, the streams, the dates, the places, the kingdoms, the people who actually existed. Uh, all the other religions, they have mythological, kind of mystical ideas about their heroes. They don't write down legitimate things about them that they were, you know, bumbling idiots at times. Um, also, stories from outside the Bible, like historians, Greeks, Romans, Jews, Christian haters, they actually also confirm all of the dates, places, and um, stories that took place in the Bible. Uh, there's also uh, more fulfilled prophecy that I believe, but it kind of seems like every single p piece of evidence that I give you is just is just not anything that you want to accept. And then any evidence that you try to give me is because you don't like the Bible. So basically, I've been supporting my argument this entire time, and you don't like my evidence, and you have supported your argument about there being no God with no evidence at all, except for saying there's a lot of stuff you don't like about my Bible. No. So again, I yeah. said when talking about objective morality, the way you do that is you compare which answers moral questions. So in that case, it's like saying, yes, his answers are wrong in that case. But that wasn't the argument. So again, as I said, like four times, that isn't right. an argument against God's existence. That's just that's sure. just about objective morality. Right. But and, our conversation is about the existence, right? Isn't that right. what you said? Right. So, so the, the my argument against God is that naturalism explains everything better. We have actually evidence for how life and information and the origin of Everything in the universe came about just by natural processes. There's no evidence of a God whatsoever. And yeah. that concludes naturalism is better. So, so that hypothesis answers things better, which is why this. Right. Well, you've given me absolutely zero evidence that naturalism can account for the universe or life. The only, the only evidence you gave me was the, the clay RNA thing. Life emerging I've, from non-life. Yeah. I've, re I've received that. I mean, I, I've already said that that's, I'll, I'll, I'll claim that that was the one time that I said your evidence was not good. How many times did you claim that my evidence was not good in, in supporting supporting my claims? And so I think at this point, we're probably both going to believe what we want to believe. And um, we had a great conversation today talking about that. Sure. I, I can agree with that for sure. I think that it's an interesting conversation to present both of our sides and essentially just let the audience decide what they think is more reasonable. It's a Great talking with you. It was a pleasant conversation. You're no Darth Dawkins, that's for sure. Darth Dawkins is a guy we get in fights with. So, Jeff Dawkins? Dar Darth Dawkins. So I don't know. Who that yeah, is. He's he's an internet troll. Don't worry about it. But yeah, it was well, really. I'll tell you what, my my number one goal in life is to make friends with people and get better at disagreeing. So like I I never ever ever want to get into a fight with people. Yeah, and it was pleasant talking with you. I enjoyed hearing your thoughts, and you didn't interrupt at all, so it's great. You're a wonderful person to talk with, so I really appreciate you coming on, and it was love to talk with you again sometime. Thank you. Love to talk to you, too. And if anybody wants to uh, – I, I made a short film about uh, evolution and the origin of life and all that stuff, and they can see it on readysetquestion.com if they want to check it out for free. Yeah, and, and if you guys start doing that uh, meetup thing again, send me a link, and I'll post it in the description for whenever you guys start doing that again. Sounds good. All right. All right. Much love. Have a nice day.